Marhaba friends, how are you? Um, my name is Meriban. And my name is Gunesh. We are right now in Jingwar. Um, I am doctor, um, general doctor. I am here for six months already. And I was building this clinic uh, that started three months ago here in Jingwar. Um, and now we were building, now we are already working in this clinic that combines like conventional and natural medicine only for women and children. Before this, I was I was in in the military in a military hospital in one of the cities from here. No, during the invasion, really not doing too much, but I learned quite a lot there. It was interesting experience. Yes, and here it's Heval Gunesh that it's also he related with the clinic. Um, I have been here for a couple of months at Genoa. Um, I am not a doctor. I um, was working before um, as a medic in other places in Rojava. Um, during the um, defense of Sarakinia, I was working um, as a combat medic. Um, and so I came um, to the to Genoa to work with the Shifa Jin, and also I'm learning a lot here. Um, so, yeah. So we will try to um, to make kind of a speech, uh, trying to give uh, answer to some of the questions that uh, you sent to us. Uh, we hope uh, the information is useful. So let's go. Um, so we'll start. There was a question about what healthcare is like on the front lines um, in Rojava, and um, I what I can say is that. Um, like combat medicine is not so um, developed here, although it's something that friends are really working to build up um, in Rojava and have been for several years. Um, so slowly, slowly, we're starting to see like integration of um, more of this combat medicing role. Um, however, there have been, in, for some time, have been um, active um, military health infrastructure. Um, there are people working in hospitals, um, and then usually. Um, friends at the front line are trying to transport wounded friends to the hospitals um, in the best way that they can. Um, I, th I think particularly lately um, there have been some exciting developments in terms of um, people on the front lines receiving um, like basic training in using tourniquets and um, other things like that. But um, in general I think um, can be um, quite heavy and there's not so, as much infrastructure as obviously as we'd like um, but friends are definitely working on it. Um, what I can also say is that here there is a huge value given to um, Havala Brindar like friends who have been wounded um, and so after they're coming off the front line or however they're wounded maybe not on the front line um, their like care is taken really seriously and there are um, these places called Malabrindar where friends will go to heal, these, like the house of wounded friends, to go and heal with other friends who also have um, injuries or sometimes um, illnesses um, that are quite heavy um, when they've been in the military. Um, and then here, what I think is really great is that even if someone has like lost a leg or they have like a heavy brain injury or they don't have like um, function in their their hands in the same way, there is always a place for people to continue struggling and continue working in different ways. Um, and so, um, and there's, you know, physical therapy also um, for wounded friends and things like this. Um, so people continue to struggle even after they've been um, wounded and it's really incredible the things that um, people are doing. Um, with all different types, types of bodies and different levels of ability and things like that. Um, I will try to, see, to, to talk about which is the perspective here in Rojava about health. Uh, yes, and what is going on a little bit. I have to say that, I mean, the revolution here started like around nine years ago no many things have been done uh, the in the health field uh, many things but still no like the most of the, of the things they are still a project no and every day there are steps no further 
So, um, as far as I read, I, uh, no, and as, as far as I have been told, no, um, the the perspective on health, no, uh, in this revolution, it's one concept that they call um, natural health. When they talk about natural health, it's not a health that use natural medicines or and just this, no. Natural health uh, means um, this um, state, no, that uh, the people uh, would have in w if we would uh, live in a free society, no. So um, the the health system, no, or the health approach in the revolution uh, wants to work in health in order to uh, through this work also liberate society. Tamam. So it's not just about uh, to see which are the health problems and to give a solution, no. Like uh, it's working, no, in Europe or, or in America, no, in the healthcare system. You go, there is a problem. I give you this medicine or this one. If it's chemical or natural, but the approach is there is a problem in the body. Then um, we give a material solution no uh, no here the approach it's like no that um, th through different ways no uh, through the health also to change the mentality in the people no uh, for sure no uh, the idea is to change the mentality following the the principles uh, as you mentioned in the questions no about uh, the principles of a democratic, ecological, and free woman society. No, so so um, how it's possible to get uh, to get this no in the um, in the health uh, field? Um, I think one of of the most important things uh, going on right now. Uh, it's like um, almost four years ago, uh, an academy for uh, doctors started and also there is an academy for nurses that I think started even before. And in this academy, no, uh, uh, people is being trained uh, in order to become doctors, doctors that will be only able to work in the Federation of Northeastern Syria, no, in the liberated in the autonomous area outside, no, the the degrees not recognized, and I I I meet. I met people who is studying there and I saw the um, the programs and really these doctors, these nurses and res are receiving uh, really um, political education, no? They, they um, study about uh, medicine, about biology, about everything as I have studied, but there are different um, classes where they are also talking about politics, uh, they are talking about ideology, they are talking about uh, women freedom, about genealogy, you know so um, about natural medicine no uh, the perspective on health uh, from these doctors and nurses that uh, um, will uh, um, come out from these academies uh, of course there will uh, it will be this uh, more closer it will be closer uh, to this uh, approach that the revolution uh, it's um, proposing no uh, nurses there are uh, there are already working but doctors uh, it's almost around one year uh, until uh, the first generation of doctors from this academy will start to work um this in this academy no at, at least uh, for sure in the nurses academy it's mostly women because no for centuries it was like this but in the women uh, in the academy for doctors it's also no there are more women than men this is also one of the um, uh, important things that the revolution wants to uh, change no of course here uh, there is still going on uh, a big problem no one of the uh, difficulties that no the revolution is facing in health it's like uh, here there is a very patriarchal approach in health in the hospitals in the clinics no um still because uh, no the doctors are mainly 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 men 
And even if they are well at Paris, they are uh, very sympathetic with the movement, they are um, uh, ideological, they have uh, very clear ideas and very nice, they are very still very patriarchal. No, They are ma men and they are men with power because they are doctors. So it's quite uh, still awful, the terrible, the... Um, the atmosphere in the hospitals and uh, of course no in all the um, plans that uh, there there are written and decided in congress about health in for kurdistan no this is one of the topics no uh, to 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 get that more women uh, Ha, uh, take uh, more important roles no, inside of the hospitals that they are not only released to nursery and that uh, also all the um, people uh, working in health they also um, have education related with genealogy no, with, with women freedom no, as uh, about another political topics um, so the plants, no, it's this uh, perspective, no, also natural in natural health, of course, the um, idea is to to re, to re, to use again, no, all kinds of natural medicines, but also the chemical medicines. There is not a rejection from for the in front of the chemical medicines or in front of the um, different different medical techniques that, that have uh, been discovered. The approach is like that: all these chemical medicines, all this technical stuff. Uh, uh, it should be um, should uh, work uh, respecting the nature and also in favor of the people, no? Not uh, in order to get uh, benefit as it's happening, no? Different lobbies trying to uh, get benefit, no? As you know, in health, it's like, no? One of the most important feed, uh, fields that is feeding capitalism. So um, here they want to mix natural medicine, chemical medicine, technical developments, of course, no? Uh, to because there are many things uh, that also science have discovered and they are important or useful, but from another approach, no? Um, also, uh, the proposal is, uh, and it's already going on, this, um, it's a health system that it's built from the base, no? That uh, it's uh, based on natural health and it's democratic and it's f um, free. Uh, what it means that uh, the health is a topic that uh, it's being um, it's present even in bueno as maybe many of you already know no here the society uh, no uh, because of the with the idea of the democratic confederalism it's organized no since the level of com communes no in the neighborhoods in the cities uh, in the village no there are communes these communes organize themselves then there is a bigger assembly no from in the district in the city in the region and no there are um, representatives of every assembly that uh, meet in the next level and like this no until big uh, congress and big levels until Kur kurdistan no so since the com level of the commune there is a committee that it's the health committee and work on health tamam and i will send you a paper a document that i have where this organizational stuff it's very clear uh, and then, no, it's like the population, the society uh, has to take part, no, in building the 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 health in 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 their society, in uh, observe what are the needs, uh, in observe what um, are the possible solutions, no, and to discuss it and to make proposals uh, from the bottom uh, to up. Of course, uh, because of the situation here, no, the war uh, going on all the time, uh, the embargo, no, uh, the borders closed, difficulties to get materials, uh, medical materials, uh, food, uh, every kind of material. So here, um, the organization, the organization of society, is something that every day. Um, no, there is work uh, that uh, is being done, but uh, it's just, there is still a lot of work to do. So the commune, the communes are working, but there are places that are working better, per places that not they are not working at all. No, because the people still have quite a stat, uh, like quite a how to say in English, a statist, 
uh, a mentality, yeah, like status, status mentality, no? So they only want to go to the uh, commune if they, if they need something, if they have a problem, no? Different realities are going on in different places of this uh, autonomous territory. And then there are places where the, 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 um, this topic about health is more present, uh, places that are less, but this is the idea that uh, working well, working finally it will be built uh, for sure um, and then uh, of course no there are there are conference congress related with health no in in the region in all the federation of East, northeastern syria also in all kurdistan no every two years they make conference congress they decide what are what are the next steps no with representatives of different the different assemblies and like this um also, uh, right now, uh, the health system is almost uh, free. There are only some surgeries that uh, the people has to pay uh, a small percentage of the um, money and depending on the hospital, but it's almost uh, um, get it, this step about that, uh, about a free health care system. Uh, before, no, uh, it was uh, free, but it was more related with uh, the doctors. If the doctors wanted money, depending on the doctor, you have to pay more money or less money. If there is an emergency and the one doctor doesn't want to make the surgery and you don't, uh, you didn't have money, pues the doctor was gonna not to make the surgery. Now, no, it's more uh, control. This, no, about there is some. Uh, how to say agreements and it's almost uh, everything free only the medicines no some surgeries and, and some medicines have to be bought in have to be buying the uh, in the, the in the um, pharmacies um so also no you were asking about um how is if the no how is um the revolution putting in the center the women also in the health topic no um i mean there is a already there is a it this is also part of the strategy for health it's accepted it's uh, heavy little by little going on no the idea is uh, that a uh, women movement also inside of health uh, has to be uh, built no um because uh, no, like the domination, the systematic domination in society started when the um, when the male dominant power started to uh, to uh, how to say in English manage society. No, like five thousand years ago. So the solution, the revolution, the change of the society cannot uh, come from this uh, side. No, it has to come to come from the women side. No. Uh, and in in of course in health it's even more clear no because health was uh, the topic from the, it was a, a women topic no the caring of, of health in societies in communities until no in middle age around uh, 15th century no with the witches hunting uh, to no uh, in order to to establish capitalism uh, no the women related with uh, health um thousands of women were uh, murdered no and then science modern science was uh, built and also this knowledge this uh, profession about health was put in in men hands and then this kind of medicine that we uh, live to nowadays uh, was built no essential i mean very important leg to build capitalism so it's also in, in essential that uh, it's women who uh, are the vanguard in health, no? As in full all the revolution in health, especially, no? So um, because of this, no? Um, how to how to build this woman uh, health movement, no? Pues uh, with the as I said, with the contents that are being studied in the academies. Um, also, there is, for example, a um, uh, a structure called Wegfajin, no, this uh, it's a civil structure uh, that 
it's part of the no strategy uh, organizational strategy uh, for health uh, it's a group who exists in all the federation of northeastern syria and uh, they are women who are uh, teaching women in different uh, topics no in different health topics trying to um, give back all the knowledge that was uh, stolen no and also of course uh, giving political uh, meaning no to all the situation and all the context no uh, another uh, uh, step no in this strategy to create a women movement on health it's the creation of this uh, clinic in Jinguar no uh, we opened three months ago it was uh, part of the project of Jinguar since the beginning uh, and then the idea here is also women healing women sharing knowledge catching wo- uh, knowledge for uh, from women so it's like also um, uh, like through the health no um while we are uh, trying to uh, change no our approach to health and while we are sharing time healing each other together we are also um becoming uh, more uh, united no and then through this unity it's also possible to see with more clearness no which is the oppression no that we are facing so Yes, this clinic, uh, it's like kind of a pilot project that it will be reproduced uh, in another areas if it works, no? In order to, yes, to give back, back knowledge, to give a uh, service to the uh, women, no? With another values that are not the male dominant uh, values uh, to recover all the knowledge that uh, it has to pu- to be in that has uh, that was hidden no and to put only the uh, mother science knowledge uh, on the top um, yes and to make different kind of investigations about how is the situation in society and to engage uh, women and to create unit um, what else of course also no all this uh, work in the communes going on in the communes uh, there are also mm, communes going on um, that are only for women no in the neighbors in the village and then also the t- uh, health topic it's being uh, treated uh, in these communes and another steps will be done but this is the idea no that are the women who are um, being the vanguard uh, pushing uh, the health in another direction in Rojava in in Federation Northeastern Syria. Uh, Of course there is still a lot to do because as I said uh, at least in the hospitals uh, there is a lot I mean it's still really patriarchal places but I am sure it will change because uh, the steps uh, that uh, has uh, being done. Also, you talk about how is the what is the um, presence, what is the importance of the natural medicine in this area. I would say in the healthcare system, in the healthcare system, it's almost not uh, present. If you go to the hospitals, to the clinics, it's not present at all. This uh, natural medicine. Um, but I would say that, uh, of course, no. As I said, in the uh, plans that are for um, for the health, uh, of course, no. And she was in, no. Our clinic is one of the first step, no, combining uh, natural and conventional medicine. Uh, but also, I think in this area, especially uh, this. Um, knowledge is in the women from society, especially in the rural areas, no. Here around, we are working every day with women that came from different villages and they have quite a lot of uh, knowledge about natural medicine if you compare with Europe or with another uh, Western places. They, they, they used to recollect herbs every um, time that uh, it's the, bueno, always where is the time, no? Or the most of the women they have in the house, some, the most important herbs, they recollect and they write and they use it during the year, no? Um, also medicine, medic, like healing ways related also with religion, no? With another kind, kind of uh, beliefs, with another kind of uh, 
thoughts, um, but they use it still, no? So uh, I would say that um, even, no, that I have to say also that the women, they are quite attached to the, <laughs> to the chemical medicine, but still preserving uh, quite a lot natural uh, medicine knowledge in com if we compare with other areas in the world. Um, and also, no, when we talk about how is what are the difficulties, no, that uh, are being faced, I would say uh, this patriarchal mentality is still in the in the healthcare system, no, in clinics, hospitals, no, ruled by uh, doctors. That it will change. I have really a lot of hope when these doctor women start to uh, work and also really politicize uh, yes new winds will come uh, also uh, really uh, the mentality here and as in another the most of the world no uh, in front of health the mentality it's this uh, capitalistic uh, mentality that you go to the doctor if the doctor doesn't give you medicines drugs you you will not heal, you will not um, get better, it's not a good doctor, no? So, like, uh, the people leaves the health really in this product, like, uh, if uh, it was just a product, no? Like, what is happening, what is the solution? Uh, the solution is right now and, and it's from something external, no? So, there is, there is a lot of work to do in... Yes, in in re-educate society to in order that they understand, no, like uh, how the body works, how it's connected, no, the soul, the soul, the main, the mind and the body, no, and that it's not only everything about drugs. That these drugs um, attachment it was brought because there were interests, no, in many situations. In another situations, the drugs are needed, no. But this is quite a thing uh, that uh, a lot of work has to be done, no. In reeducate the society in understanding the body, in understanding the interest, and then in cut a little bit this um, relation that the people make about um, tamam healing and drugs. If there is no drugs, there is no healing. And also, of course, because of the embargo, it's embargo the name in English. Uh, there is difficulties, a lot of difficulties to get different medicines, different medical. Uh, uh, machines that are needed, no, in the hospital, many hospitals, they are uh, working with quite broken stuff, no, or they are not using the the right medicines at all because they are, cannot get them. So this embargo for the medical works, it's a really difficult um, problem. Tuck, tuck. And then also, um, no, you were asking how to support um, the women struggle here. Then I would say, uh, in one side, as always, no, uh, it's very good. No, it's very important that uh, in the ways that uh, you can, you spread all the information, no, that you can about uh, the situation here, no. Uh, about the projects that are going on here, no, about the situation, about the all the political and geopolitical situation here, about the attacks, no, about the murders that are going on, no, about all the terrible stuff that it's uh, go, um, uh, making, uh, that it's doing, no, the Turkish state and the um, the mercenaries and also no, the the complicities with the other states that are uh, allowing uh, them to do this because they have interest, no. But also, no, our project in Jing, uh, the Jingwar project or the clinic in Jingwar uh, or about genealogy or uh, about the ideology here, no, all the things that you agree, no, about uh, the history, how we arrive until this point, no, all the information, no, that um, about what is uh, uh, being built here, of course, this is very important, no. Um, and then I would say uh, also, of course, recollecting money, no, because we need money. We need money, for example, here in Jingwar, we need money for the village, we need money for the 
for our cleaning, no? In the clinic right now, we are recollecting money to buy, to pay the ambulance and also to to build a laboratory because with the laboratory we will have a lot more uh, autonomy. Um, in another side, no? Sometimes also Hebasur uh, is recollecting money, no? I am not aware at all which are the ways, but um, of course money is being recollected. And also, um, like to think how you can uh, uh, how you can build something similar there, no? Since I mean, no, of course the, the goal is think how you can build a revolution there, but in a more uh, easy level, like no, for example, we have this clinic here for women and children with this natural uh, health perspective, trying, trying, and doing uh, small steps every day no if it would mean it would uh, make sense to build something similar there or to for example jingwar no women village if it would be make sense to build uh, a women village there so more concrete projects no to rep to see how to reproduce repro uh, in another territory if it makes sense if it makes sense and also um there is a a campaign no called women defend rojava campaign uh, in this uh, campaign uh, all the different informations uh, actions calls for actions uh, related with the uh, women struggle and army are being uh, shared uh, there is a website, there is a Twitter, uh, and also it's not a virtual uh, reality, no? It's also going on um, in society. In different countries no, around the world, there are committees uh, from Women Defend Rojava who are uh, organ trying to organize no, society um, in different ways and uh, uh, organizing actions and uh, writing things, the, uh, spreading information. So uh, this is a campaign that was thought in order to connect uh, the revolution with outside, no, and to coordinate a little bit. So if you don't know it, have a look on the internet, Women Defend Rojava. And I think it's uh, um, all I could... Uh, Say until now, I will have a look very fast. Have you have? Do you want to say anything else? Mm, not really. Well, I think while we're talking about health, um, something that I always think is really interesting to think about and to share is um, how mental health we're seeing it work differently here. Um, like when I first was coming to Rojava, I was wondering a lot how are people who are having such um, heavy, difficult experiences of war, both people in the military and also just people outside of the military whose like, homeland is being invaded and under attack and who um, are dealing with what such heavy things, like how are they continuing to cope? Where I come from, there are a lot of people um, in the like political um, uh, groups that I'm coming from like who are struggling to continue in the struggle because they're so like, incapacitated by like depression and anxiety and all of these different things and so I was just like blown away that people could be dealing with such like heavier things here and still manage to continue struggling and that's something I wanted to like understand and learn from myself like um, and I think something that is really clear is that much like how Havel Medivan is talking about this, um, this like natural um, health, this idea of like how do people, um, like what is their health like in a, when they're able to le live in a free society? I think also mental health is dealt with in a similar way. Like we don't see, for example, a lot of therapists here. I've never seen actually a single therapist here. <laughs> and we don't have like group therapy or anything like this, but we do have Tecmo. Um, and after every like major action, people are at least supposed to make Tecmo, and I think usually do, um, which is where people are coming together. Tecmo means report, but it's also, um, it comes from the tradition of criticism, self-criticism. And so it's a space where people are able to come to a common understanding of um, kind of what has happened and what's going on and how um, things can be improved so that they can progress. And I think it's a really important tool especially for people who are dealing with experiences together, like if a Tabor is making 
or a, like a, a group that's fighting together is making tech mill together, then they're able to kind of process. But I also see how in just the way that we are all of us living our lives together here in such a, a collective way um, makes things a lot easier to deal with. I think that there are some things I think it would be unimaginable to deal with you know, um, I come from the U.S., like, things are very, um, like, individualistic and, like, separated, and it's very, very easy to just disappear into society, and to, it's very easy to become alone, and here it's, like, impossible to find even, like, five minutes alone, because <laughs> we live our lives, like, really so, so much more together. Um, if you have a work that you're doing, if you start to work in front of a friend, especially a Kurdish friend, they will not let you work unless you let them help you. Like, if your friend is cleaning, then you're in cleaning. If you have a project, well, it's the, vill- it's the village project. If we have a big work, we do it together. And I think in this way of living, it's a lot, um, it's a lot easier to continue every day and to get up and to keep working. Um, and I think that friends here also have an approach of of trying to stay in motion and trying to um, when in like moving on to different works and not staying in the same work for like 20 years but um, always trying to um, be um, contributing in more like new ways um, and I think it's also really unique like here um, the movement is working sort of like even if you're totally new to this place, even if you haven't met anyone yet and you don't have anyone that maybe in the West you'd call a friend, like anywhere that you go, that there are people from the movement, you have friends. Like you, um, I I remember the first time I was seeing this, I was very sick and I went to the hospital and I was waiting for test results and I didn't know almost any Kurdish at all. Um, And so I was like feeling really awkward, like standing around. And suddenly someone um, else in the hospital who was there because he was very severely wounded and so he'd been coming for a lot of different treatments. So he spent a lot of time at the hospital. He just came right up and he was like trying to explain to me my test results and like asking about how I was and he was showing me around the hospital and we ate lunch together and he introduced me to his other friends. And like, it's really like, I, I thought that he was a long lost friend of this other person I was with. And then at the end, it turned out that actually he was just a total stranger and he was just being really nice. <laughs> and this is kind of the approach of friends is like you can have these conversations with people like like you've known each other for years after you've known each other for just a few minutes, because there really is this um, idea that we're all in the same struggle together. Um, and so any any person in the struggle is my friend. Um, and uh, I think that that really makes makes it possible to to keep moving. Hmm. Yes, it's really important what you said. Um, I think a few weeks ago I asked to a um, friend who is um, 20, well, he, she's 25 years already fighting here, and I asked about, because many times when we receive questions from, uh, especially from Europe, no, uh, about why, how the trauma is being uh, managed in Rojava, ta ta ta, and then sa- suddenly I was like, okay, here, I mean, I ask about the trauma, but the society never talks about trauma. No, it's not existing, as Kevalgunes said, no. But also, I see also how much we are centered on this topic, no, because mm-hmm. we are always talking. About, and then I asked to her, why here? I mean, why the people is suffering a lot, but it's not falling down, no? Why, okay, the community, no? Uh, we are together, we help each other. But what do you think? How it's possible that the people it's not just collapsing, no? Sometimes happen, they collapse for a few hours and then they continue, no? But, and she said, like, that uh, one of the most important things it was uh, that uh, the people believes in the resistance. Uh, because no, all these uh, 
reality has been created here in the last 40 years, no, with the party, especially with the PQK, no, that it's like, no, uh, the people who is following this struggle, no, will give until the last drop of uh, blood, until the last one is alive, no, so the resistance, it's like they believe in resistance. So this friend, she said, um, if suddenly something happened, would happen, and the, the faith on resistance will finish, all the people will will just f fall down and be finished and collapse. But as far as they um, will believe in the resistance, they will continue, no? And they will m manage to share, no? In the community, how they are feeling in a natural way, but without collapse, no? And also, she was talking about this, no? That the also, no? Like this feeling about the... Um, Camaradeship, the Hevalti is so big, no? Also, it's one of the biggest things that are making possible this revolution, I think. Uh, also, no, with the vanguard of the women, these two things. But uh, she said, no, if you are bad, if you are feeling bad, and if you fall, if you fall, uh, you it's needed that your friends uh, then take care of you, no? And it's like no everybody is so worried about to give as much as they can to their comrades no and to to don't show that they are bad they are sad they are having difficulties in order that this pain these difficulties are not affecting to the others or or that the others that it's a kind of balance, no? No one falls down because then everybody is keeping the balance, no? And if one falls down, then the others have to take care, the others will feel pain, the and then the balance is like kind of broken, something like this, I don't know. And also I was thinking now, though, that I was talking about the healthcare sy system, thinking especially, no, in the civil uh, hospitals, because it's the most of the information that we share, no, it's about the civil hospitals, no. Um, but no, here in in this territory, there are two kinds of hospitals, no, there are the military hospitals and the civil hospitals, no, and the military hospitals, they are for the defense forces, no, and really, no, I have to say that, uh, of course, in these military hospitals, the patriarchal mentality is there because it's everywhere. But I have to say that the, the two months and a half that I was in one of the military hospitals, the atmosphere that I was living there, no, as Jehovah Gunesh also was talking, for me, I don't know, I realized that uh, these, uh, these military hospitals are, are very important also to feed the revolution because it's like no hospitals uh, who give service to the defense forces and the workers of course they are people who support the movement they are people who share the ideology no if not they would not be there no and then suddenly for me it was kind of romantic uh, <laughs> trip to be there in the sense of no every as you said no how much value it's given to the wounded and then every time that uh, different friends come uh, and they are wounded and they have to give to to make an operation or to receive attention or to stay in the hospital, like there is so much love there from the workers in the hospital, from the other wounded that are in the hospital, no, from the friends that come to visit but they care about everybody, not only about their wounded, no. So really, inside of these ho military hospitals, for me, it's kind of it's a place where this uh, union, no, in front of the enemy, it's really uh, strong, no, or this love, no, to 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 take care of the wounded, to in order that they feel as much love as is possible, they recover as fast as as, as it's possible, no. Um, I don't know, no. Of course, many times I don't know. I was, for example, sometimes sometimes in the surgery room when Brindar uh, wounded came and from the medical point of view it was quite 
horrible because <laughs> no like emergency nothing related with asepsia with pro you know preventing infections it was like woo <laughs> but really like everybody was there inside of the surgery room g- giving moral to the per- friend who was uh, receiving the operation no like everybody doing as much as they could with a lot of love so i thought okay asepsia and infection there will be <laughs> we have antibiotics but But this kind of wow meaningful moment you know like i don't know everybody like taking care of the other for a goal no and you need it i don't i think it's this it's very important i thought i want to make this kind of hospitals in our territory yeah. <laughs> but we need defense forces also yeah. then it's not <laughs> only yeah. hospital yeah yeah I, i think also the um the I think also um the 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 feel I also feel really different in the hospitals here like I hate I hate hospitals where I come from they're like a horrible place it feels really bad but you come into a hospital here and it's like you can almost just hang out there you know like it, it actually doesn't feel so bad um and I was talking to um a friend who is uh, in the structure that I was coming from um who got in a really bad car accident and she was um told like that uh she wouldn't um it would take like quite a long time for her to get better um and that she wasn't allowed to like smoke cigarettes or do any, and like the friends like to smoke a lot of cigarettes here and um that she had to eat like this very specific like she foods that were good for her she had to stop drinking energy drinks but she drinks a lot of them and then um and that uh like she maybe shouldn't have so many visitors or whatever like by the the western friends who were like oh it'll take you so long to heal And then she had constant visitors for like days and days, so like very little time to rest. And they would sneak her cigarettes, and she would smoke them by the the window. Like all these things that in the West would be like, this is so bad. Like she'll never heal. But the healing time was so such a small amount of time. She really got so much better, like so quickly. And she was saying she thinks it's because she was always with friends. You know, like she was never she never had a moment to feel to feel down about herself or feel hopeless or feel. And I I really think there we can't discount like the importance of of hope like in in yes. healing so yes 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 and also this um I see no this such a big will to recover mm-hmm. because you left friends mm-hmm. in the front line no for example yeah. or in your nocta or whatever and it's like you I see wounded friends that they were doing really everything that it was needed every everything following all the steps to mm-hmm. recover because they wanted to recover in in two weeks yeah. but I mean <laughs> yeah wa- some they were impossible no but yeah because they wanted to come back with their friends yeah. to continue fighting no because they can they couldn't leave thinking I am here my friends are still there fighting yeah no? and I think this is no this will of go on yeah because of the love for your friends especially yeah. it's very good i think it's like sometimes friends are not even thinking about recovery sometimes they're very very regimented but sometimes friends are like no i'm totally fine and they're like they're like on crutches and they like don't want they don't have one of their legs and then they are have a rifle in the other hand they're like i can totally go back to the front line and you're like not right now <laughs> like or like friends who have been really heavily wounded And then, you know, when Serkinia was invaded, like literally running away to try to go to the front line because also the friends didn't want to let them like go if they weren't if their bodies weren't ready for it. But, you know, the will to defend, like the will to be with comrades and um and to struggle is like really, really strong, especially in the wounded friends, which also like in the movement here, one of the ideas is like that much like women are the the vanguard of this revolution and they're like guaranteeing the success of this revolution mm. when people have been wounded and they've given already so much of themselves they also become like a vanguard and they also become like a guarantee of the the mm-hmm. revolution mm-hmm. and i really see that really strongly mm-hmm. in friends here already yeah so <laughs> we could continue talking five hours but i think <laughs> probably best not to <laughs> Um, yeah well um, lots of love to all the comrades where you are um, I hope uh, some of the things that we uh, said um, 
they will be useful for you. I I I feel sorry because my English is not very good. I <laughs> I, I hope you understand <laughs> the things I said. Uh, yes, and then yes, a lot of love, a lot of strength, especially love because with love later the strength comes. And yes, keep connected. <laughs> We are very happy uh, to make this link with you. And yes, let's continue. Ser Captain. Hello, my name is Chef Gare. I'm a nurse from Scotland. I've uh, currently been in North and East Syria for about nine months. Um, on the subject of COVID-19, um, things have been slightly unusual here. Uh, we haven't had so many cases. Uh, not so much confirmed cases. Um, it is, as we all know, you know, um, a very real possibility that there are a few cases, a few cases over a month, a period of months, and then a big escalation. But at the moment, um, we don't have so much cases here in North and East Syria. Um, our situation has been complicated uh, in part by the October invasion and annexation of parts of North and East Syria by the Turkish army and their jihadist proxies. Um, one of the the only town, in fact, in North and East Syria, Syrikini, uh, that had a PCR, which is the machine for doing the testing, for confirming if people have corona or not. This was destroyed during the bombardment um, by Turkey, including their attacks on hospitals and on healthcare workers and ambulances, deliberately targeted attacks. Uh, so this means of testing and protecting the population was lost uh, and is still in the hands of the jihadist proxies of Turkey as they attempted ethnic cleansing along the, the northern side of northern Syria as well as in Afrin. Um, these jihadist proxies also control water access to one of the larger cities, Hesika, uh, which is about a million people and also is near the Al-Hol camp where um, the 70,000 or so women and children uh, from the Daesh, from the ISIS caliphate are being held. Uh, and there's also the 10,000 um, suspected fighters, men, um, there as well. There's a, another camp, Washakani camp, on the other side of Hesika, which is mostly people who were displaced from um, Syrikani and, and the areas in the north that were occupied by the Turkish invasion. Uh, in October. So all of these people have been put at risk because the, the jihadist proxies control the water supply and occasionally just cut off the dam, you know, for a few days here and there. Um, and this kind of weaponization of water is, is a war crime, um, but it is one that the city is facing and with summers here reaching 50 degrees Celsius, there's a, a series of other issues, obviously that impacts people as well as you know lots of uh, problems of infections and other diseases you can catch from having a lack of access to clean water um, it is a really big problem but I think to tie it back to corona we often hear that one of the things you have to do is you know to wash your hands regularly with soap and water and what you're seeing is that the we can't even do that you know like this basic step of uh, self-protection of protecting your family and your community and even working in the hospital here um, it's it's not possible because we don't have access to fresh water um, mm -hmm. so even though it seems like the October invasion is finished and things are peaceful we are still the consequences are still very real um, and it is impacting the ability to respond to coronavirus Another thing that's complicated the response to coronavirus here um, is the creeping presence of the Assad regime. Um, like a lot of autocratic states, um, the regime, as we've seen, you know, from Brazil to Belarus to the United States, the regime has consistently downplayed or ignored or just outright fabricated lies about the coronavirus problem. So it's really hard to get any kind of accurate idea about what's happening down in Sham and in, in southern Syria. Um, furthermore, 
the World Health Organization has been hand in hand in its compliance with the Assad regime on this, um, repeatedly refusing to send out their rapid response teams to test some of the people we wanted tested, or those samples getting lost on their way to Damascus. They insisted that it was reasonable that there was only one testing center in Syria, in Damascus, and that we might have to wait two weeks for a response. Um, just to contextualize that, like the PCR machines, the machines that do the tests are, you know, four to six, ho four to six hours. Um, and there's one in every single hospital in the UK. Um, at least one. Uh, so the fact that the World Health Organization were saying this is fine, this is a reasonable pattern, we're refusing to assist the North and East Syria, um, showed a even by the standards of international NGOs, a pretty staggering compliance with the Assad regime. Um, as far as the World Health Organization and the UNHCR and these people are concerned, Assad is Syria and he is North and East Syria, so they're quite happy to pour through their aid to Izlib um, uh, with the assistance of Turkey, the, the Turkish-backed jihadist proxies, so they can get aid, but as far as they're concerned, concerned, the people of southern Syria, Dara, doesn't matter, the Assad regime. And there's a long documented history of the international NGOs handing over international aid to direct the regime to distribute as it sees fit. Um, so on one level probably shouldn't be surprised, but the who's, the who's complicity with uh, the Assad regime when it came to coronavirus was, was pretty contemptible. Um, it kind of came to a head when we had a case of a man who died in the start of April uh, from Hesica, from one of the cities here in North and East Syria. And for two weeks, the regime and the World Health Organization, they didn't tell the local autonomous uh, health structures, they didn't tell any of the municipalities in the town, they didn't tell any of the doctors in the hospital working with him. Uh, they didn't tell anyone for over two weeks, and then it was a leak from the local office, actually, that confirmed that this person had coronavirus, and that the WHO had just seen fit to go along with the regime of just not telling anyone. Um, so that's, you know, two weeks of contact, two weeks of spreading. Uh, another area we had problems was the regime chose to reopen flights from Damascus to Kamishlo, one of the cities here in the north. Um, and the Autonomous administration wanted to do temperature checks, you know, um, on people coming out. And the regime, the airport is in the is regime held in Kamishlo, so the regime just flat out refused. Um, and we had to kind of do checks of people for possible quarantining, you know, sort of as outside the grounds of the airport. So definitely not a, a foolproof net. And if people go in different ways or even get in taxis or just refuse, the regime was there to back that up, because there is no problem, of course, and there is only one country, uh, Syria. Um, so, these things, between Turkey's aggressive invasions and backing of jihadist groups, and uh, ongoing, you know, drone strikes, um, a few weeks ago now, there was the, the drone strike assassination of three uh, women organizers from the Congress Star here in Kobani. Um, so that this ongoing war of aggression and their jihadist pro proxies um, is also putting a strain on the healthcare system, making it hard to, you know, seal off hospitals and make them quarantine zones or taking away time and resources. So you have this on the one hand, the effect of the October invasion. Um, a lot of people living in tents who otherwise would be in their homes in Sarakeni had they not been displaced and the use of water as a weapon of war. And on the other hand, you have the, the regime who would ideally like to use every opportunity to like forever leverage their presence here and to leverage their power um, to creep back like a different kind of plague. Um, so th these structural political things, as well as the closing of the aid uh, crossing by Russia and, this, and the... Security Council um, back in January and again um, just a couple of weeks ago, Russia and China saying all aid should be distributed via the regime. Um, 
like these things have made it hard for us to be able to reliably get equipment. Um, so, from an anarchist perspective, the autonomous administration has been forced into uh, developing a lot of things on its own in terms of the personal protective equipment, finding its own ways and routes to get PCR machines, to get testing. Um, and so now we have done testing of suspicious cases, particularly in Jazeera, uh, which is one of the regions of North East Syria. Um, after the October invasion, when all the MSFs and the USP, the UPPs, and all the international NGOs all ran away, um, there was a lot of anger, I would say justifiable anger, at having been abandoned, and that drove some energy into building more autonomy, because what became clear was that after eight years of these international NGOs helping, quote-unquote, was that there was no autonomy in the system. There was just absolute chaotic mess everywhere, like depots full of random medications in French from the MSF, and like large depots full of things mixed up, abandoned by the American military in their retreat. Like, it was just chaos. And there'd be no autonomy built in the system. The system was still dependent on these benevolent saviors. And so, like... There was a push at the time, you know, to, to not allow this to happen and to build more autonomy. And although there is still a lot more to be done, you know, it's very challenging circumstances, um, I think this energy is still there. And particularly on the more military health side of things, um, I think it's really good. I think it's really positive to be developing things internally and training people up internally and having responses that make people less dependent on these outside organizations who have been so complicit uh, with Turkey's invasion and with the regime's ongoing crimes. Um, so it's it's not good because we've, you know, been abandoned and cut off and unable to obtain supplies. Um, but at the same time, there is like a really strong will here to turn that into autonomy and into strength and into, you know, to, to reflect and use the perspective to develop uh, a better way of organizing health um, that will be less vulnerable to the the whims of the international community. In terms of the healthcare system that we have and, and, and the patriarchy therein, um, it is definitely a challenge. There is amazing projects like Jinwa and there are lots of very good nurses and doctors, uh, especially coming from, well, nurses coming from the new academies, um, which are obviously teaching a more standardized nursing education, uh, which ha has been lacking due to simply just needing hands, needing people <laughs> to start learning, not being able to always give people the more formal training in uh, medicines and, and giving medicines and things. So a lot of people have learned on the job um, and just trying to standardize a bit more so that all the nurses will have a similar levels of education, which again is being done autonomously by the administration. Um, but I it's also really important that this is being mixed with um, you know the ideology of the movement in terms of genealogy in terms of democratic confederalism and although you might say what's that have to do with nursing I think sort of humanizing holistic care like engaging in the importance of like respect for your patients and respect for them if they, you know, die. Um, you know, ensuring the patient's dignity and building in factors of consent. Like, these are all, you know, important concepts in nursing back in Scotland, where I'm from. Um, and no one would say they're not an important part of nursing. Uh, and I think the movement's in a really good place to, like, 
look at why it's important rather than just we do it because otherwise we get in trouble from the sister. Um, it's, you know, the movement's got a good place to challenge the, the old-fashioned kind of medicine that all the world has of the doctor just sort of holding court and you, you have the thing where if the patient sort of asks what's being injected into their veins, the nurses and doctors look a bit surprised. They're just like, why are you asking? You know, we're the doctors and nurses. Who are you to ask what we're injecting into you? Um, and I think this is, yeah, it's just, I don't think it's specific to here. I think it's just incredibly old-fashioned. That sort of like, no questions asked, doctor knows best kind of thing is, is a thing that you still occasionally see back home. And uh, I think it's good. It's being challenged sort of slowly, slowly. There's a... One of the things that's really impressed me here has been the care and consideration for the, the wounded. Um, there's a sort of recovery places called the Malabarandar, the, the homes of the wounded, um, where you get a lot of peer support from people, you know, similarly wounded, and a lot of physio, and a, like a, quite a lot of good care and checking up, and so... There are a lot of people with life-changing injuries, um, but there's a really strong sense of peer support and of solidarity and of not just letting people sort of disappear, thank you for your service, now off you go, um, of keeping people involved in the movement. And one of the things that you see in the, the hospitals in particular is a lot of the people helping to run the hospitals are themselves. Um, Berendar are, are, are wounded, they've lost a leg or, or lost you know, an arm or uh, they have in some, some way been wounded and been through the system. And I think that really builds in a sort of, you know, a visceral sense of caring about the rights of Berendar. They themselves have been in this position. And then for the people themselves, the patients themselves, they, you know, can see in the people working in the hospital, like a peer and, a, a, you know, a fellow wounded person, a fellow comrade in the struggle. Um, rather than like an authority figure or, you know, just an administrator who doesn't really know them. So I think it's really important that even though there's the kind of challenges and the, the patriarchal behaviors, particularly the doctors, um, a lot of whom, a lot of whom are amazing and have skills that would be really great to show the world, particularly the ortho surgeons, but there's quite a few who haven't really updated their training since they were trained in the Soviet Union, and it, you know, it shows. Um, but there are these problems, but at the same time, one of the things that's really impressive is the level of, like, peer support. I know, like, in Glasgow, where I was working, a lot of the nurses were very critical of the new Southern uh, Hospital, because it's put everyone into single bedrooms, and or ortho in particular, like the people who've had amputations and these things, um, had gone from being in little four bay beds where there's lots of other people going through the same thing to do, peer, you know, just peer-to-peer -peer support informally, um, to being stuck in a room alone and having, you know, usually healthy, young, teenage or early 20s nurses and doctors coming in and being like, oh yeah, everything's fine, everything's normal, and it's just like not necessarily that reassuring coming from those people compared to the kind of solidarity of peer support. So, like, that is a, a thing nurses in the UK were critical of with this, the new Severn Hospital in, in Glasgow. Um, so people are aware of it everywhere, but what's really nice is that here it's uh, an integral part of the healthcare um, that Malibur and are, are part of it and that the, the wounded are often involved in being active in the running of the hospital, you know, as managers, not in a token kind of way, as a, in a proper way, that there are ways for people to still be involved and that people can kind of yeah, see that and recognize that as well. So it's one of the things I really respect about here. So we did have a lockdown um, in March or sort of April time. Uh, because of the situation, as I previously mentioned, with the jihadists and the Assad regime, the administration doesn't necessarily have the means to like 
flood the streets with police and control people the way that you saw in France uh, and other countries. Um, even if it wanted to, which I don't think it does. So the response was very much based on like talking to the doctors about the best means that we could afford and what sort of controls could we do. So the healthcare sector was very much involved in talking to the administration. And also the Hepage, um, the like local neighborhood watch type communities that usually consist of lovely middle-aged people whose job is to sort out problems in the community um, without having to people to go to the police or what would not that we have police the Lashkari um, without having to go to the Ashkari the sort of the, serving the same kind of function as police so the idea is to have as much of the problems in the community sorted by people in the community um, through a process of you know discuss the very traditional like discussions and lots of chai and um, working out to resolve problems in a way that is acceptable to the community as a whole and ideally avoids getting the sort of larger structures involved. Um, so they were a very good response to coronavirus in terms of if people were in quarantine, then like the local members could check in on those people and see that the family had enough food and no one else in the family was getting ill because it's very hard to isolate people. Um, when you've got large families, it's not like Sweden, where like 40% of people live alone. It's, you know, very different here. Um, there's not even individual bedrooms, so it's it's quite hard. So it's checking in on the family, checking in people have enough supplies and food and all these things. And so trying to get that involved at the grassroots kind of neighborhood level um, was a big part of it. But generally the compliance relied on voluntary compliance. Um, some people here found it a bit baffling stuff they'd heard about the United States and the, and the UK. Um, just the reactions of people to being asked to care about other people seemed very strange and lots of people here related it in a sort of joke form to, you know, well we survived the the plague of Daesh of ISIS um, so we'll stick together, we'll band together, and we'll work together, and we'll survive this plague too. Um, so the the lockdown and the support, it, was a, it wasn't really sustainable, as we've seen with a lot of uh, economies around the world. Um, for us, the main resource that we have is oil, uh, and the price of oil collapsed. So that was a really big blow. There were some arguments from, you know, some community members that we should really focus on subsidizing families in order to maintain it longer, but with the price of oil as it was, and it's, uh, it just it wasn't deemed sustainable, so we had to lift the lockdown, and we'll see how that goes. Our strategy, I guess it's hard to know how effective it is, because um, we haven't had so many cases. Uh, it's at a point where lots of people you know, kind of are beginning to think it would just never come here. And uh, I hope it isn't a big case here, you know, I hope it is like regions of the world like Campania and, and things in Bali that had very, very low cases. Um, but, but yeah, no, it was notable, the sort of community-based response here compared to what I was hearing about back home uh, in the UK. Um, it was a, a noticeable difference that the administration tried very, very hard to make things very, very clear to everyone, to make it clear why this was a problem and what people should do, um, and people kind of taking that on as a protecting themselves, protecting their families, protecting their communities, which required almost no persuading at all. So, um, in this way, the response is good, and I'm sure if the numbers do start to increase, then we will see a good, strong community-based response. Um, that doesn't mean that people aren't very vulnerable, particularly in a hall where <coughs> obviously the conditions are not very good, and then also the community there are Daesh. Like, so they're not terribly compliant with things we ask them to do. But um, we'll see how that goes. But I hope that we don't get an outbreak on that scale. But 
generally across North East Syria, it's you know there is some faith in the autonomous administration. There is some faith in the SDF um, from the communities here, uh, especially compared to how people feel, how reliable people feel the regime is, or how reliable or people who suffered under Daesh. Um, so there is some faith that people don't need to be necessarily told to do things in order to like see the communi you know, humanitarian good. Um, so, as we've seen, you know, just in the last couple of weeks in the UK with the the systemic ignoring of women's voices with regards to use of sodium valparate for pregnant women and the use of vaginal meshes, you know, there's a long way to go in combating patriarchy everywhere. Um, working in Scotland, about 96% of nurses are, are women and the majority of doctors I think working in the NHS now Greater Glasgow Clyde did some numbers on this are women um, and you know that we've still got a lot of systemic uh, problems and patriarchy and things happening in the system so it definitely takes time so here it's a similar sort of thing it, 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 it takes time in order to make the care more you know women centered and, and listening to women's voices um, it is happening with the academies, you know, the women's liberation is one of the tenets that people are being instructed in, that we have the inspirational examples of a lot of the havals from the women's movement, from the YPJ, particularly on the, on the military side, obviously, um, who are now working in the hospitals. Like I said, a lot of the wounded then go on to work in health care, um, not just in direct nursing roles, but also in the administrative roles and the well, it's not management because it's a non-state anti-capitalist structure, but in the logistics and organizing of the hospital. Um, so there's lots of you know female comrades there from the military side. Um, so like these things are it definitely at the forefront of people's minds. Um, the challenges are, are very, very real, but it's something that people are talking about. It's something that people are pushing to change um, and are really open about the importance of acknowledging the problem and changing it, which I think is you know, a huge step in keeping up the energy and focus on getting that done rather than saying, you know, everything's fine, we have equality. In terms of how people can support the movement and the health works here, um, Havasor Akkurd, there's, there's two, there's Havasor Akkurdistani, who, who I think mostly work in um, Bashur, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, Havasor Akkurd, it's like the Kurdish Red Crescent. Um, they are the only NGO uh, working in North and East Syria. Um, especially after a lot of the, the UNs and the MSFs all ran away in October. Um, they're the only ones really keeping things together, keeping people fed, providing treatment and, and health care um, to people in the camps, including our hall camp, um, but also across the Sheba from people who uh, were forcibly evicted from their homes by the Turkish occupation of Afrin. So like across the full length of, of North and East Syria. Um, Hevisor are doing lots of amazing work, not just in the camps, but also uh, in some of the smaller towns and villages with like clinics and hospitals, um, and also supportive of the Jinmar Women's Village project as well that the friends are describing. Um, I think because the UK has a very strong stance against North and East Syria, against people coming here. Um, this is one of the only ways that, you know, financially really you can support people here. They do lots of good work, and I think it is a good route in terms of other ways to support, raising awareness about Rojava the, and the, the revolutionary struggle here, the ideas of the democratic confederalism, the ecology and women's liberation, um, getting involved with the local Kurdish solidarity movements, um, yeah, 
the UK, again in particular, has, has been really, really complicit with the Erdogan regime and taken a really hard line against British people being here, um, even though the British army was in full support of the SDF forces as like an ally against ISIS. Um, somehow they have now decided that all those people who were democratic allies are now terrorists. But So I think there is lots that can be done in terms of organization, in terms of uh, taking some of the ideas of genealogy. I know in lots of parts of Europe, um, particularly in Italy and Spain, um, genealogy, the, the revolutions, idea of the science of women and uh, looking at women's ideas and history and so on, um, has been pretty huge. And so I think that's a, a good way people can get in, engaged with the movement. Things can't just be copy-pasted, obviously, from here. But I think there is a lot that people can do to build up solidarity networks, build up awareness. Um, if people then are wanting to come, obviously, that's a thing that can happen. Uh, I think... I know herbalists um, is one of the things they're hoping to develop more here. So people with those skills would obviously be much appreciated. Um, and anyone who wants to learn, you know, it's not to professionalize the revolution. I think that's a big part of it is trying to deprofessionalize and have everyone have lots of skills, um, which is really good. And uh, demystifying a lot of health and medicine and things as well is really important. Um, so not having like super specialists, but having Lots of people have skills to look after themselves, look after their families, look after their communities. Um, yes, those are the main ways I would say people can support. There's the supporting Hevisor Akkurd, um, and then there's the usual organization agitation. Uh, I think particularly for people in uh, Scotland, in the UK, uh, there is a lot that can be done because the British government are so in line with Erdogan's ethnic cleansing campaigns um, that there's a lot to object to, to what the British government are doing in terms of arms deals, in terms of these things. Um, there's a lot to bring people's awareness of. I think there's a generalized support of Rojava and maybe a lack of awareness about how in Britain the we're kind of complicit in an attempt to crush Rojava. Um, so, yeah, I think there's lots of campaigning, and as I said, the local Kurdish solidarity movements are sure to have more ideas about how people can find out more, get more educated, and also get more involved.